Thank you, Dr. Matthews, and thanks to everyone listening and joining us for this podcast. I'm very excited to welcome our guest for today, Dr. Jennifer Gans. Dr. Gans is a clinical psychologist and researcher specializing in the psychological impact of tinnitus and deafness on well-being. In her private practice in San Francisco, California, Dr. Gans treats clients with tinnitus and other hearing-related difficulties. She holds a master's in deaf education from Gallaudet University and received a doctorate in psychology from Georgia School of Professional Psychology. She is the co Founders, excuse me, she is the CEO and founder of MindfulTinnitusRelief.com, the first ever self-administered eight-week online skill-building course of its kind for learning how to live comfortably with tinnitus. Peer-reviewed studies completed and ongoing show the efficacy and long-term benefits of MindfulTinnitusRelief.com course for reducing tinnitus bother. Dr. Gans presents globally to the medical community on how to work with and communicate best with their tinnitus patients, a critical piece of the tinnitus management puzzle. Dr. Gans, thank you again for joining us on this Continued Social Work podcast and for sharing your expertise with our listeners. We're happy to have you. Oh, thank you, Ben, and I look forward to uh, sharing what I've learned. Thank you. So before we get started, um, or actually, I would like to get started with, if you could, for our listeners, in layman's term, describe what is tinnitus? Many people maybe haven't heard that term. I know that I've often mispronounced that term, and my preemptive apologies if I do that during our conversation. But if you could, um, for our listeners, just in layman's terms, what is tinnitus? Well, first of all, tinnitus should always be described in layman's terms because it isn't complicated. And so I think that we'll you know, be talking over this hour and everybody will see why um, it is a benign body sensation that the brain has misunderstood as something important to pay attention to when it can very comfortably put it into the background. Now, backing up a little bit, tinnitus, tinnitus, it's tomato, tomato, uh, is really just that. It's the, it's the sensation of hearing a ringing, a buzzing, a chirping. It can fluctuate uh, sound in the I guess you could say in the mind, it, it feels as if it's somewhere in the head. Sometimes it feels like it's in the ears. Sometimes it feels like it's coming from all over the head. But it's, um, again, a uh, benign body sensation that uh, the brain has misunderstood as important to pay attention to, but uh, can be experienced as a ringing, a buzzing, a chirping noise in the head. Interesting. Thank you for that. Now, how did you first get involved in this type of work? What brought you to this specialization of tinnitus uh, care? And I know that a lot of your work also has to do with mindfulness as a management tool. Um, how did this become your um, area of interest and later area of expertise and specialty? Right. And so as a clinical psychologist, uh, my area of specialty has always been deafness. And I've done all all things in deafness, uh, from the deaf culture side to the medical side of deafness and everything in between. And uh, while I was working at the Cochlear Implant Center at UCSF, I was obviously seeing uh, deaf patients who were preparing to get a cochlear implant, but I was also hearing on the side, or not necessarily on the side, but hearing a lot of people coming in complaining of, of tinnitus ringing in the ears. And so, uh, you know, after a while, you start to, to listen up and, and you know, there, um, I started to become very curious about it. And I started learning about pain management, chronic pain management using mindfulness-based stress reduction. This was a program developed by John Kabat-Zinn in the 1970s and um, uh, it has been uh, really well received and uh, has shown incredible efficacy with chronic pain. And so anytime I see research with chronic pain, it makes me wonder, could this possibly be helpful for somebody with chronic tinnitus? So uh, back when I was at UCSF, I started to kind of dive into the mindfulness meditation uh, area in, again, with chronic pain and saw amazing results. And um, so what I ended up doing was thinking, well, gee, I wonder if this could work for the patient with tinnitus. So I basically flipped uh, 
the mindfulness-based stress reduction program into a program that is very, very specific for the person who's bothered by tinnitus. That is so interesting. So this podcast is geared specifically for social work professionals who maybe don't have um, don't have that knowledge of tinnitus, but maybe uh, those that are working in the area of medical social work um, right. may come across uh, may come come across people that are living with tinnitus and struggling with tinnitus. And I think that that combination, the way you've been able to work through um, supporting these people uh, on your caseload and using mindfulness techniques, something that maybe is more familiar to some of our listeners, I think will be um, will be really helpful, especially mm -hmm. for social workers that are working in maybe a medical setting. Now, um, if you could, for a moment, Describe a little bit more what causes tinnitus in a patient or in, in a person. What's happening in the brain of a person with, with bothersome tinnitus? Yes. Well, I like how you uh, differentiate bothersome from non-bothersome. Now, in background, I, I've sat for now thousands of hours, thousands of hours now with uh, people who have bothersome tinnitus. Now, if you look at the demographics of tinnitus, in just the United States, there are 50 million Americans who experience tinnitus, big, big number. However, but you have to break that down a little bit because of that 50 million, not everybody's bothered by tinnitus. So what we find is that about 20 million, still a huge number, but a, it, uh, definitely smaller than 50 million, but 20 million Americans are bothered enough by tinnitus to actually go to their doctor, to go to their healthcare provider, and say, wait a minute, this ringing in my ears, this is, this is bothering me, this is not okay. And so those are the patients that I see. And so if you do the math here, you, that leaves 30 million Americans that are walking the streets of our country with tinnitus, but they don't care because they're not bothered by it. And so we, before I mentioned briefly that tinnitus is a benign body sensation. And so, you know, if you have a benign body sensation and it doesn't bother you, then you aren't bothered by it. So there's no problem. So what we're really talking about today are the 20 million Americans that are bothered enough by their tinnitus to go to their doctor and say, wow, this is affecting my quality of life. And so, um, so what, so when I'm working with my patients over again, thousands of hours, I've, I've noticed that there are three things that are effective for helping people with tinnitus. And this goes back to what's happening in the brain. So number one, I call it the tinnitus trifecta. I like when things kind of fall into threes, it seems a little bit more manageable. But anyway, the tinnitus trifecta for me, and any time that I'm starting to work with a tinnitus patient or a patient with tinnitus, I'm thinking three things. Number one, I wanna help them feel less anxious about tinnitus, that's important. Number two, I wanna make sure that they are absolutely 100% an expert in what tinnitus is and what it is not. Now, this one is an interesting one. Now, this one's very important because humans, we are meaning-making creatures. When we don't understand something, we become very anxious. All right, COVID is a great example. Uh, when it first hit, you know, nobody knew what it was. Even the best of the best didn't know what it was. And so we, I think of like a volume switch. Our anxiety levels were just turned up way, way high, up to 11. Um, anyway, so... Uh, when we understand something, it doesn't necessarily make the issue go away, but we become less anxious about it. And so that's why the number two, becoming an expert in what it is, is incredibly important. Uh, and then number three is finding a way, I think of it as um, tuning your orchestra, tuning your brain, and finding ways to relax so that you can then do the hard work of learning how to manage tinnitus in the brain habituate to it or put it into the background. So let's talk about, or talking about those three, um, what is what is tinnitus? What's happening in the brain? So again, I'm going to say it probably 15 times before the hour's over. Tinnitus is a benign body sensation. Now, benign does not mean good, okay? Benign means that it is not an indication of a greater illness, okay? So yes, I mean, it, you know, so something benign doesn't mean it's not uh, incredibly bothersome. Now we can have, for example, a benign tumor. Nobody wants a tumor, but thank God it's benign, right? So here we have tinnitus. Yeah, nobody wants tinnitus. I've never met anybody that said, hey, I'd love to have some of that. Instead, um, 
it's good to know that while incredibly bothersome for some, we can take a deep breath knowing that this is not an indication of a greater illness. It's simply a symptom of what we're about to talk about. So what causes tinnitus? Okay, so we have to look at other body events in order to really hammer home or to really be able to understand what's going on in the brain. Okay, so I like to talk about phantom limb sensation or phantom limb pain for anybody that's heard of that. So for those who don't know, uh, if here's my hand right here. If I, God forbid, cut my hand off, my hand is literally here, but my hand is actually here, right? Because yes, technically the hand is right here, but this is where all the commands come from. This is where all the receiving of sensations come from. This is where all the memories of that hand come from, right? So if I lose the hand, in the absence of the hand, the brain starts to say, wait a minute, that's weird. Where's my hand? I was born with a hand. I've always had a hand. It has to be here. So the brain starts to search and search and search and search and search and search. And in that search, it starts to really overfire. And in that overfiring in those uh, neuronal areas, boom, it ends up creating the sensation as if the hand is still there. Okay, and we call that phantom limb sensation. For some, it's pain, but for others, it's a sensation. It can be itching, what have you. So now let's look at the ears. So tinnitus starts with hearing loss. Now that is, um, you know, that is very difficult for some, but uh, for those who don't know, hearing loss is normal and natural. Okay, as we age, it's the, called the accumulation of birthdays. Our senses generally don't get better. Okay, I'm, I'm wearing contact lenses, but, you know, if we were doing this video, a, you know, a couple of years ago, I wouldn't be wearing contact lenses, right? So what I'm trying to say is that with time, our eyes get, you know, less uh, sensitive, our ears get less sensitive, maybe a, a less sense of taste or smell. And, you know, we just keep on moving forward because that's just the way we you know, the body's designed. And so all of us, not some of us, all of us after a certain age have some form of hearing loss. Okay. For some, it's measurable. For others, it's not measurable. Okay. Uh, and we can get into that if that's interesting to, uh, to the viewers. But um, all right. So again, uh, you can tell I'm, I love this topic. I can really go on and on, but let's, let's bring it home to from phantom limb sensation to the ears. Okay, so when, when, when we all lose some hearing loss in our adult years, the brain starts to say, wait a minute, I've always heard that frequency, it has to be here. And it, you know, I was born hearing that frequency, I've always heard that frequency. And so we have these tiny little hair cells that are lining the inside of the cochlea. And the cochlea is the last hurrah before sound goes to the auditory nerve and to the auditory cortex. And so inside that cochlea, we have these tiny little hair cells. And I'm going like this because it's shaped like a conch shell or a snail shell. And so inside, we have those tiny little cilia or hair cells. And those are what transmit sound to the, the movement of those hairs transmit sound to, the, sound to the auditory nerve and to the auditory cortex. And we hear. Now, when some of those hair cells are missing, the brain starts to say, wait a minute. Where's the, where's that sensation? Where is that frequency? Where's that sound? The brain starts to search and it still can't find it. It starts to really panic and searches and searches and searches and man, it still can't find it. And then in that search, in that craze of looking for it, because the brain doesn't like gaps, the brain likes to fill in gaps. Boom, we get the sensation of tinnitus, which is generally, a, for many people, it's a high ringing sound. We generally lose our high frequency hearing loss sooner that has to do with the, uh, you know, where the hair cells are in the cochlea, we can certainly get into that. But that is my long winded way of saying that our brain is searching for a sound that it's no longer receiving. Nothing's broken. The silly mind is just searching for a sound that it's no longer receiving. And in that search, it creates a, um, uh, that, that very bothersome signal that many of us feel. And you mentioned that for many that can see that can be a very high pitched constant ringing in the ear. Are there yeah. other ways that tinnitus might manifest itself um, that that people might might experience? 
Yes. Well, I, you know, again, I've, I've seen it all, <laughs> you know, people come in with, uh, I mean, you know, there's a long list of, of descriptions of tinnitus that people bring into me. It's not hearing voices. That's something very different. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is, um, it's usually a high pitched ringing, a chirping, a whooshing sound. Uh, for some, it's constant. For some, there's a pulsation that seems to correspond with um, maybe a, the, the heartbeat or something. Uh, it is, um, for some, again, it can be constant. Sometimes it's bothersome, sometimes it isn't. I mean, it is all things under the sun, to be honest, but uh, it is, it really is a palpable, for, for those who haven't experienced it, it really is a, a, a buzzing, a chirping, almost an electrical signal um, of all sorts. It can be a low rumbling sound as well. And that okay. usually corresponds with a lower frequency hearing loss, but for the high frequency hearing loss, it tends to be more of that kind of staticky, high pitched kind of sound. And, and is this something that, that a person would experience just on a constant basis, or is it something that would come and go at different points in time in their, in their life, or, or are there varying levels of severity that a person might experience? Yes, and all of the okay. above. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just to make things interesting, it can do all those things, and it can do all those things within a five-minute period. So um, there's no there's no hard, fast way to describe it for the person. Everybody has their individual experience with it. However, it's always benign. Hmm. Okay, and 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 so you you. You've spoken at length about the, the bothersome versus um, w whether it's bothersome to the person or not, that that is going to be um, an important delineating factor mm -hmm. in that work. I know that um, for some, or actually, can you speak to about how, wh what are some of the demographics there? Are more people going to fall into the first category of this becoming bothersome, or do people learn to, to live their lives with it? Are more people going to be feeling, maybe fall into that latter category of the unbothered person with yeah. tinnitus? Yes. Um, so you ask a great question, uh, and I'm smiling because it's one that I really enjoy explaining to people. Uh, both in my work individually, but also to groups of people that are interested in working with the person with bothersome tinnitus. So I, again, after thousands of hours of sitting with people with bothersome tinnitus, now I, I have learned a thing about this 20 million group. Now I haven't sat for thousands of hours with the people that fall into the non-bothersome group, so I'm not going to speak to that category, okay? However, there are three things, again, the number three comes up, there are three things that every single person that I work with and every single person with bothersome tinnitus that I have come across in my thousands of hours, they all have three things in common. Okay. And so, you know, again, after so many, so much time and, and study and, and devotion to this type of work, you start to notice things. You start to notice things about the person behind whatever the symptom is. Okay. And so I want to tell you what these three things are, because it's not in 50% of the people I work with. It's not in 85% of the people that I work with. It's not in 99.999% of the people I work with. 100% of the people that I work with, with bothersome tinnitus, have one, two, and three in common. Okay. And so I'm going to share with you what it is. And so uh, the first thing is hearing loss. We already spoke about that. This is 100% necessary, and I would venture to say that this is true of anybody with tinnitus in the whole 50 million group. Whether it's measurable or not measurable, everybody at a certain age and stage in their life has some hearing loss. So oftentimes this part is not interesting. So we don't spend a lot of time, uh, after the initial description, we don't spend a lot of time talking about the uh, hearing loss part. Number two thing that everybody has in common is stress. Okay, and yes, we do talk about this. This is a very important and necessary portion of this, so to speak, the tinnitus recipe, I call it, okay? Number three is an amazing personality. Isn't that interesting, right? So lucky me, I get to sit with people with amazing personalities. And so I'm gonna describe to you what I mean by amazing. And I'm not just trying to make my patients feel good about who they are, although that obviously is part and parcel of my profession. Uh, but what I really um, 
want to make clear to the people that I work with is that there is something amazing about their personality that is part of the tinnitus trifecta, okay, that is absolutely necessary. And the reason why I call it amazing is because once I tell you what it is, you'll realize that it's what makes this person that I'm sitting in front of with tinnitus, it, it's what makes them good at what they do. It's what makes them an effective human being on this earth. It's what they love about themselves. It's what others love about them. So it's actually an amazing personality, but it's the underbelly of that amazing personality that is what is pulling them into the bothersome category, whereas they might have fallen into the non-bothersome category. And if with my patients, I can help them identify this amazing personality and the underbelly of it, that gives them some choice and freedom to start making choices as to how they want to respond to tinnitus rather than react. Okay. So I'm going to tell you what the amazing personality is. And for all the people that are watching this, maybe it's people that have tinnitus, maybe it's people that work with people with tinnitus, maybe it's people that have never even heard the word before. But uh, so this amazing personality and, you know, just think to yourself about that person with bothersome tinnitus that, you know, and, you know, just think to yourself as to whether or not I'm correct or not. So this amazing personality, the person with bothersome tinnitus, they are the type of person that is very, very aware. They're very, they ver they're very alert. When they walk into a room, they scan the room and if they spot a problem, they latch on and they have trouble letting go until they figure it out. Okay. So, and again, I don't mean this, this next part it by way of, of diagnosis. It's more, more as a descriptor, but they tend to have almost like an obsessive compulsive quality to the way they go about things. Okay. And so what we see, i to use my hands a lot for <laughs> signing, obviously. But so here we have tinnitus, a benign body sensation, but we have a fire underneath it that's making it burn. And that fire is anxiety. So here's this amazing personality. And, and to be honest with you, the reason why I say amazing is, you know, who wouldn't want to have somebody in their life that spots a problem, latches on, and won't let go until they figure it out? I mean, that makes, that's the makings of a, a good family member, right? You, everybody needs somebody in their life like that. However, it's when, it's when you're holding on to something and you create a story around it and it becomes ossified. And that story is usually not a pleasant story that it then becomes a bothersome uh, body sensation rather than the brain can open up its lens and allow it to go where it belongs, which is in the background. Oh. That, that that is really interesting. So this fixation that you talk about um, around it is what can maybe even exacerbate the effects of, of tinnitus and, and definitely contribute to to it um, to a person maybe becoming stuck. I know that you use that term. Um, you, you use that term in some of your work. That idea of a person becoming stuck and then unstuck. I wonder if you'd be willing to go into that a little bit for our listeners of of what we might mean in that regard. Yeah. Well, you can tell that I love to simplify things and, you know, forgive me DSM, but, but uh, if I was to describe to you what tinnitus is, it's a stuck disorder. Now it's not a disorder. It's not a disorder, but, you know, jokingly, I think of it or not jokingly, I don't want to, I, I also have to preface this by saying that while I can be very blasé or very kind of cavalier sounding when I talk about tinnitus, I want to make sure that the person that is either listening to this or people that I speak to in general understand that I know the gravity of it. Okay. And this, uh, you know, this topic that I love to speak about can also be very devastating for people. And, and it's not lost on me. This is, um, so let me, I probably should have entered into this talk by, by putting that forward, but, um, uh, so stuck. Okay. So, I like to make a lot of analogies in my work and inside our mind, we have what I call a telephoto lens. Maybe others call it, uh, have spoken about the telephoto lens. I mean, if you think about the eyeball, the eye is a, basically a telephoto lens, but so let's take the mind and let's, let's, uh, the, the, the mind's lens can zoom in on something 
And boy, when it's zoomed in on something, it can see what it's looking at with great, great definition and clarity, but to the exclusion of all else. Okay, now if I take that zoom lens and I open up the aperture, what I'm still, what I'm looking at is obviously still in the picture, but it's within the context of everything else around it, right? And so again, with this amazing personality, this person has, and, and we, we do need to talk a little bit about the stress part, because I think that that's a very, uh, a very important part of this puzzle. But going back to this camera lens, what happens on the first day, not the first day, but when, when somebody experiences tinnitus is bothersome, maybe for the first time, what does the mind do? It goes like this. Oh my God, what is that? Oh my God, could this be a danger? Oh my God, maybe, maybe I have a brain tumor. Oh my gosh, you know, oh my, this is my fault for listening to all that music when I was a kid or, oh my God, I'm going to have to quit my job or I, I just can't get out of bed like this or what's going to happen when I'm 80. And, and, you know, all of a sudden, again, we have this benign body sensation, but it can very, very easily get wrapped up in a riddle inside of a Gordian knot, I call it, that goes on and on and on and can start to really, so we're no longer talking about tinnitus at a certain point. We're talking about this necrotic story that it can get wrapped up in. So, um, so really what I'm helping a person do with tinnitus is kind of get the glue off that camera lens. I mean, you know, it's it's almost like they're walking around like this, that all they can see is tinnitus. It's, it's the, you know, there's nothing else but tinnitus. Their mind is fixated on it. And so if we can, with those three things, number one, helping the patient feel less anxious about tinnitus. Number two, educate them on what it is and what it isn't. There's a lot of junk out there, and that's certainly um, a whole other topic we can talk about. But all it takes is one bad piece of information to get the mind doing this again. So we have to be very sure to give them accurate information. Okay. And this is what, um, and then finding ways to relax yourself. This is also very critical because the person with the mind that is, you know, bothers and tinnitus tends to have a lot of anxiety, a lot of fire beneath it. And so if we can help them, I call it tuning the orchestra and just kind of being able to take that deep breath and, and calm, we can start to, the, what happens is the lens starts to loosen up and we can start to open it up and see tinnitus within the context of everything else around it. And to be honest, the brain knows what to do with benign body sensations. In fact, we have many of them going on in our body right now that we're not even aware of because the brain has better things to be doing. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully people are paying attention to this podcast and not, you know, not to their foot that's resting on the ground and the sensation under their foot. Now, if I mention it and I say, hey, let's focus on your foot, you can certainly bring your attention there and focus on it. But when we are in this conversation, that's probably the last thing you're thinking about. So similarly with tinnitus, we're hoping to have the brain reappraise it for what it is so that it can shift it into the right category. And once it goes there, it's hard to be afraid of a paper tiger. Right. Yeah. So I, and I want to, I want to come back in just a moment to, to this idea of, of how stressful that can be and, and stress, stress as one of the, one of the parts of that trifecta that you describe, and then um, how you started incorporating mindful mindfulness into working to help support people um, who are living with tinnitus. But first, I, I wonder, what is it that's going to be bringing people in to see you in the first place? What are maybe some of the um, some of the top complaints that you hear from people uh, with tinnitus in your practice? Uh, great point. Uh, and um, this is something that I was hoping to talk with about today is that we've already discussed tinnitus as a benign body sensation. So yes, tinnitus, bothersome tinnitus is what gets them in my door. But once we clear away one, two, and three, we start to realize that oh my gosh, there's something that's fueling it below. And so it's actually, you know, it's, I kind of say it tongue in cheek. People think they're coming to see me because of tinnitus, when in fact, they're coming to see me for anxiety, depression, and sleep difficulty. Isn't that interesting? Now, now tinnitus is the thing that's bringing them into my office, but after 
you know, after I go through the first three, after one session, maybe two sessions, we start to talk a little bit less about tinnitus and a lot more about managing anxiety, managing depression, managing sleep difficulty. Now, I would say the primary issue that I, again, this is um, based on my uh, years of experience, but it's primarily anxiety. And when somebody's anxious for a long period of time, it can become very depressing. And and sleep deprivation, my gosh, I mean, it, it, it could take down the best of us. And, you know, this scrambles the mind. This can get your orchestra out of tune in no time. So really, these are the, these are the drivers. Mm. Interesting. So let's, let's pause there for a moment to talk about what do we do with this, this patient that's coming in to see you that's struggling with sleep disturbances, that's struggling with um, heightened levels of anxiety that and maybe even manifesting as depression. I know that for many of our listeners who are social workers in behavioral health settings, especially mindfulness is something that has been incorporated into this work. How have you incorporated that into your work? And I'd love if you would share with our listeners a little bit also about your eight-week online course uh, um, that can be found at mindfultinnitusrelief.com um, mm-hmm. as you're as you're talking about how you started incorporating mindfulness into helping support the people you're working with. Right. Well, here's a rule of thumb about tinnitus. Stress increases tinnitus bother. Relaxation decreases tinnitus bother. Okay. And so when a person has bothersome tinnitus, they're basically sentenced to a life of having to find a way to relax themselves, okay, on a consistent basis. And what, now, is mindfulness the only way? Absolutely not. However, it's a pretty darn good way to tune the orchestra, okay? It's just good mental hygiene, okay? And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't involve a pill or a procedure that can take a person down a very different road. Now, that's not to say that I am, you know, we can certainly talk about the role that medication plays. Uh, but, you know, we, that's, that's usually not the first thing that we want to jump to. And certainly developing a, a meditation practice for those who are a mindfulness meditation practice for those who are familiar with it, it's, uh, it's, it's just a good support of any treatment plan that we have for our patients. So uh, that's really, um, uh, so before I start each and every one of my sessions, I start with a five minute breathing exercise. And so why do I do that? Well, I think of the brain as a, um, as an orchestra. Okay. Or there's many different ways to describe this, but I think of the brain as an orchestra. In fact, I have a, a young child and I, she was asking me about the brain. So I went to obviously Google the computer and I printed out a picture of the brain and I was like, wow, that's weird. It looks like a different sections of an orchestra. There was the red part could be the violin section. You know, the, well, the um, brainstem could be the violin section. The trumpets could be the prefrontal cortex. The, you know, the trombones could be the amygdala. So it's, we have these different sections of the brain and just like a symphony, you know, it, no conductor would ever get up in front of their orchestra and just start playing. I mean, that would just be, that would be, you know, a symphony suicide, I guess, if there is such a thing. But uh, so they all tap the lectern and they start to tune their orchestra. They pay attention, they listen, they pause, and they, they tune up the orchestra so that the strings are not too tight and they're also not too loose. They're just right. And then amazing things can happen, right? Music can be made. Now, if that same orchestra was playing in different keys and the violins are playing in the key of A and everybody else is playing in the key of F, I don't care how good the orchestra is, it's not going to sound very good. Okay? So I think of the human brain as something quite similar. Inside of us, we have different sections of the brain. And if you're amygdala, and we can certainly go deeper into what's happening in the brain of the person with tinnitus, you know, if the amygdala is on fire and red and tons of blood flow to it. And it's just, you know, it's a well-oiled machine and it's just over overtaking other parts of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex who, you know, can otherwise help us shift our attention. You know, it's this meditation process we found can help uh, just settle the mind. And just, it's a moment to pause and pay attention, at least know where your mind is at that moment. 
And so why, why I start each of my sessions with a five minute breathing exercise is it, uh, I feel that it informs the rest of the hour. It helps me to be able to, um, you know, for people to go deeper. I find that the hour is much, is much more uh, worthwhile in many ways when, and it's also teaching them that meditation isn't something that, you know, swamis do out in, in caves and things. It's something that every human does. And for the people that say, oh, I can't meditate, my mind wanders, I kind of chuckle inside because I think to myself, of course your mind wanders, that's what it's designed to do. We have to help this person find a way to relax. And so this, uh, uh, the way that we relax is through many, many means. Meditation is just one really great way. And it doesn't involve a prescription from a doctor. You can do it at three o'clock in the afternoon and you could do it 3 a.m. in the morning. So it's it's just a gift to, to give to yourself is this ability to find a way to tune the brain so that it doesn't make anything necessarily different, but it prepares us to be able to deal with the stresses that come into our lives. It gives us more space so that we're able, like I was saying before, to respond to whatever's in our field of awareness rather than react. That makes perfect sense. I love the metaphor you use of the orchestra and, and, and having that five minute um session to to tune to tune our brain and to become maybe even more in tuned with what it is that we are experiencing i think allows us to to focus more on on some of these areas um can you tell us a little bit more about mindful tinnitusrelief.com, which is this eight-week online course that that i know that you've put a lot of work into developing hmm. yeah so i had mentioned before that while i was at ucsf I became very interested in bringing what was so helpful for chronic pain to the field of tinnitus. And so at that time, I started a research project and uh, I created, remember uh, John Kabat-Zinn, uh, an amazing uh, clinician or amazing, uh, he, you know, he created mindfulness-based stress reduction, an eight-week program that um, helps people to basically tune their orchestra. I, I took the principles of his program, the nuts and bolts to in many in many ways, and I made it very specific for the person with bothersome tinnitus. So each of the activities, each of the lessons, each of the meditations all revolve around managing bothersome tinnitus. And obviously, remember, we talked about the top three, uh, helping people, each lesson helps people feel less anxious about tinnitus. Each lesson makes sure that they are an expert in what it is. And then obviously each lesson has a mindfulness meditation practice that helps a person to tune their orchestra. Or, and um, so this, so while I was at UCSF, I started this research project and had amazing results. Now this first, the mindfulness-based tinnitus stress reduction program, the eight week program was designed to be done in person. And so when I was finished with this research project and we got these amazing results, I was like, oh my gosh, I got to get this out to the masses. And so, you know, with the help of a great IT group, um, I, sh I've, I flipped it into an online course so that people all over the world, really from touching all over the globe, um, are able to take this eight week course. Now, remem remember each lesson has these three components, but what it does is it, it teaches somebody, it's, you know, eight weeks, it, it takes about eight weeks to learn any new skill. Right. And so um, so this program is done over an eight week period where every week has a weekly lesson, which takes about an hour and a half or so, where, again, we're touching on these top three, this tinnitus trifecta or this. Um, and uh, and and then every day in between, they do a half an hour exercise or mindfulness meditation exercise that's specific again to tinnitus. And then the following week, they do another lesson, week, week number two, week number three, all the way up to eight. And there's a full day of practice between the sixth and the seventh week where they bring together all of the skills that they've learned so far in the course and really bring it into day-to-day -day life. And so at the end of the eight weeks, um, actually what the research has shown, we've uh, recently finished a, uh, a research study that was peer reviewed and published in the American Journal of Audiology, where we were finding that this course was actually helpful in just three weeks.
So even by, right, even by mid course, we were finding that there was significant reduction in tinnitus bother, in quality of life, um, and, you know, in perceived stress and all these things in just three weeks. Now, people got even better in eight weeks. So I'm never going to tell somebody to, oh, just take the first three weeks. I'm going to, I'm going to say, take it all the way to the end, take it, you know, take it home. And then what we found in this research study is that six months later, people's, uh, people's reduction or intinnitus bother was maintained. And so that's most interesting to me. I mean, sure, if something works in the, in the moment, that's fantastic, but we want to know that it's happening over time. And so that also tells me that once you shift tinnitus from bothersome to non-bothersome, it, it never really goes back into the bothersome category because tinnitus is a paper tiger and a paper tiger, obviously, you know, a tiger is a scary thing, but if it's made of paper, big deal. So um, that's the, and that, and that course, what I love about it is that uh, it is, I guess you could call it canned in that it's not live, meaning that anybody, no matter what the time zone can be taking it at their leisure at a time that feels comfortable for them in the privacy of their own home, wherever they are and have internet connection. And so it's really, um, I've made it as user friendly as possible so that people can really take advantage of um, the eight-week program itself. Yeah, that is that is great. Now, I know that um, in many of the podcasts that we've had recently, we've talked about the COVID pandemic um, exacerbating people's, uh, people's struggle with different behavioral health concerns, anxiety and depression definitely being among those. I wonder, um, in your work, did you see did you see the effect of the pandemic um, exacerbating or having more people become aware of, of, of tinnitus and did it become more bothersome for more people? Right, right. So you're asking such a great, great question. So we already know what causes tinnitus, right? We have talked about it. Hearing loss or bothersome tinnitus. Hearing loss, it's a necessary component, stress and an amazing personality. Nowhere in that does it say that COVID causes tinnitus, okay? So I'm sure that many of the people that are watching this have, you know, whether it's tinnitus or any other uh, body event that happens, you know, I think, you know, we're busier than ever, right? And so COVID, now now COVID is an, is an illness that, you know, can result in a high fever, for example, right? And so anytime we have a high fever, we run the risk of having uh, burning out some of those hair cells that I was talking about with hearing. So yes, anytime you get, I mean, we're talking like a super high fever. We're not talking about your average fever. So I'm not, I don't want to scare you that um, we're talking like, I guess, you know, 106 for an extended period of time, or, you know, it, we run the risk of damaging our hearing. So again, I talk about causation versus correlation. Okay. Now, when something goes on, everybody wants one reason that it happened because it's simple. It's less complicated when there's only one thing that's causing something. Now, we have to just wrap our mind around the fact that it's correlation, not causation when it comes to COVID. Okay. Now, so we have the potential, and you know, I, again, this is, uh, you know, to cause COVID causing hearing loss, although that's really, I haven't seen that very often. But, um, but one thing I do know is having COVID is very stressful on the body. And so if you have COVID and, and it's also a body event. And so what happens when something happens, goes wrong or feels wrong in our body, we become very somatically focused. Oh my gosh, how do I feel now? The doctors are asking us, how do you feel now? Ooh, I'm noticing that, you know, my, my breath is just really labored or, you know, wow. Oh my gosh, I'm hearing a ringing in my ear. Oh my gosh, what is this? Oh my God, was this caused by COVID? And so we, we're making erroneous causation, uh, declar you know, declarations like, you know, I had COVID and that's when I, that's when tinnitus started. Therefore, COVID must have caused tinnitus. But what we're really dealing with is the anxiety of COVID and the stress of COVID. Um, and as clinicians, we've all seen it. Everybody, I think, again, I, you know, I turned up that dial when I was talking about at that fire underneath our amygdala, our anxiety levels are all going through the roof. And with that comes, you know, more bothersome tinnitus, more bothersome pain, more bothersome everything. 
So, you know, we have to be very careful because again, we can, many people have made that erroneous connection and they go to their doctor and they say, I have COVID and then I had tinnitus. So COVID must have caused tinnitus. And so the doctor then reports that to the, um, you know, the CDC and then the CDC comes out with a report that, you know, COVID causes tinnitus and it becomes, again, we talk, we, you know, that's why accurate information is so important. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, junk out there that is not put out by bad people. It's put out by people that really don't understand the, the nuts and bolts of tinnitus and how we're really a complicated animal. Right. You, you know, you absolutely, you read my mind there. Now I uh, tend to be someone who, uh, and my wife has cautioned me against this, but tend to be someone who will sometimes Google symptoms, whether it's with our kids, whether it's things that I'm feeling myself. Um, I wonder if you would speak a bit to maybe some of the dangers of of turning to online, whether it's chat rooms, support groups, doing just the open Google search about tonight uh, about tinnitus, excuse me, and and the harmful effects and some of those symptoms. If you could for us, um, what are some of the dangers? Of, of doing that for someone that might be listening and and maybe if, could you talk about what are some of the common myths that are circulating online um, and offline uh, among people who might be seeking help for tinnitus well well ben first of all to help you feel better i do it too oh good i'm glad don't I'm not tell alone any of the that. listeners right <laughs> yes my, my my wife has forbidden M, uh, webmd for me but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> glad to right. hear i'm not the only one <laughs> well but but to, to that point you know, there are a lot of things, there are, you know, there's a lot of great information on the internet. Okay. So oftentimes if there is something wrong, you go to the internet and you get a little bit more educated. But the problem is, is that with tinnitus, there's so much misunderstanding, not again, not purposeful. You know, I don't think any doctor wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I'd like to really confuse my patients and make their lives worse. And nobody does that. But sometimes unbeknownst to them will, uh, you know, just some false information will get out there. And, and like I was saying before, people report things and doctors are required to report what their patients report. And sometimes that gets misconstrued or misunderstood. And so the problem with tinnitus is that there's actually nothing broken. And there's, and therefore when there's nothing broken, there's nothing to fix. Now there's certainly a problem, but there's something to shift there's nothing broken. The brain is working just fine. And so I think this is the problem that many, uh, many clinicians have, many doctors have, is that they are trained to fix things. So when you go into your doctor's office, you come in with a symptom and they want to give you a pill or do a procedure to make that symptom go away. And so what happens when a patient walks into their doctor's office with something like tinnitus, which is clearly, clearly unacceptable, it's bothersome, and it, it can really you know, make a life so, so, just so much suffering. So what is a doctor to do when they're being asked to fix something that's not broken? Well, what ends up happening sometimes is that we try things. We, we, uh, we make guesses. We go to a typical treatment plan that we try to take from this area and try to put it onto tinnitus and hope that it works, or we give a pill or we do a procedure that we hope works, but we don't really know. Okay. So again, I want to tell people, and, and so that's the problem that we have with tinnitus. You, you mentioned going onto the internet, you know, there's that saying that uh, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And I talk about that, that paper tiger. So again, tinnitus is a fear disease. It's a stuck disease. It, there's nothing broken. There's nothing wrong. The brain is just misunderstanding a benign body sensation. It put it in the wrong category and it needs to re, it needs to relax and relearn tinnitus and put it into the right category. And so again, going back to Google, again, it's great when, you know, for certain things, but with tinnitus, it is I mean, I, I'll t I can't put a percentage on it, but I'll tell you day after day after day, I get people that come in and every single one of them has gone online and they've gotten into that chat room. Uh, I don't know, I could call it a cesspool. <laughs> that, that, uh, that rabbit hole would be a kinder way to put it. Um, 
and like I said before, there's a ton of great information on the internet. In fact, I hope people watch this and will see this as good information on tinnitus. So it's not to say, and the mindful, mindful, mindful tinnitus relief.com course, I can't say enough about it. I think it's excellent. However, so there's wonderful stuff on the internet, but all it takes for the person that's searching is one bad piece of information to get the mind creating that story around tinnitus because we have a negativity bias. The human mind has a negativity bias. Okay. And that has survival value. I mean, if, you know, if we're walking in the savannas and all of a sudden we hear a rustling in the grass or the bushes or something, we better be alert to it because it could be a tiger, but it also could be a mouse or it could be the wind, but we better check, right? Cause I don't want to, I don't want to be caught, you know? So our, you know, our, our lens gets locked and loaded on, on negativity. And so again, the person going on the internet, all they need is that negative comment. And the, the problem with tinnitus is, is that, as we mentioned before, it's a, really about anxiety, depression, and sleep difficulty and that getting stuck. And so what we're really doing when we're listening to somebody else's story is we're listening to somebody else's individual story. And so when we try to, uh, try to listen to somebody's story and make it, you know, and, and start to make it our own story, it, it distorts tinnitus. Everybody's unique. And so, and, and to be honest with you, the people that get better, they get off chat rooms, you know? So what ends up happening is you, you get this, um, kind of morass of, of, of negativity and, uh, sub oftentimes false information and very unique information that doesn't apply to the general person with bothersome tinnitus best to, I mean, it's, it's tricky. I mean, how can somebody, somebody who's naive to tinnitus know when they're finding accurate information when they're in versus finding false information and wow, it breaks my heart. And I'm on the board of the American tinnitus association now. And one of the, uh, or one of the groups that I'm on or is how to, uh, you know, how to come against false um, advertisement because, you know, there are some, I mean, there's, you know, I, again, I, I, I'm very fond of the medical field, but there are, um, I don't really even know who they are. I don't even know if they're human, but there's um, these advertisements that swirl around the internet and boy, they can pop up, you know, you put in the word tinnitus and they're the first thing on the, on the list. I mean, it's, you know, I don't even know how to combat that. And, you know, false information is something we're all very well aware of, whether it's in politics or in healthcare. And so um, my heart goes out to the person with bothersome tinnitus. And oftentimes somebody has to go real low. And, you know, because of these um, nefarious groups out there, it could mean somebody, um, somebody's life is just filled with suffering unnecessarily. And um, it's, it's, it's a struggle. Yeah, definitely. I I can imagine. So for somebody who is at that point of, of, of reaching that point, they're at their wits end and they're looking for that quick fix. Um, I wonder if you might clear up a couple of myths that may be circulating out there um, relative to, is there, a, is there a pill? Is there a procedure? Is there a, a, a cure? for tinnitus um, from that, that someone may be looking for um, to, yeah. to help alleviate what it is they're experiencing. Yeah. Well, if you go online and you look at chat rooms and stuff and stuff, people are furious at the field of, of audiology, ENTs, doctors in general, because they're like, where is the cure for tinnitus? There has to be a cure. And I actually, if you think about it, and we can go into why there isn't a traditional cure for tinnitus, but I kind of argue that there actually is a cure. Okay. But it's not a cure in the traditional sense, but it is an effective cure. Okay. Again, tinnitus is a benign body sensation that's gotten put into the bothersome category versus the non-bothersome category. Now, if you can use the tinnitus trifecta, these three things that, that helps all people with bothersome tinnitus and shift tinnitus from bothersome to non-bothersome, that's an effective cure. So if you have something benign and it doesn't bother you, then isn't that a cure? So, so it, it's, you know, people are searching for that pill. They're searching for that procedure because it feels medical. 
it, and in and, and, and many ways it is, I, I don't know that you'd call it medical, but it is an actual body event, tinnitus is. It's not a phantom. It's the brain is really generating the sound it's experiencing. And so um, the cure is in, the, the effective cure is in reducing the fire below tinnitus, quelling that fire so that the person with bothersome tinnitus can start to see it for what it is and shift it into the non-bothersome category and there's your effective cure. And, and I never, so when I'm, when I'm sitting with a tinnitus patient, I make it very clear at the outset that my job is not to get rid of tinnitus because I, I like to do things that I have control of and I can't control getting rid of somebody's tinnitus. And in many ways, the person with tinnitus can't necessarily control it. But what I know 100% is that each and every person can shift it from bothersome to non-bothersome. So I make it very clear to them that I'm not in the practice of doing things that I can't control because that's a waste of time. However, I am incredibly invested in shifting it from bothersome to non-bothersome so that people can continue with their lives without the suffering. But you know. no, I, I was just going to say, so earlier in our conversation, we were talking about people becoming stuck and becoming stuck in, 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 in this uh, tinnitus sort of uh, snowball effect. Right. And so what you're talking about now seems to be for lack of a better term, a way for people to become unstuck. Mm. And so once a person becomes unstuck, what's next? Um, what are some management tools that, that you feel actually work in helping somebody shift and maintain that shift from bothersome to not bothersome or non-bothersome? Right. Well, so the brain is searching for a sound that it's no longer receiving because ears love to hear. And so again, in that we, we want to be looking for things that relax the brain and ears love to hear. So I say, give them something to hear. Bring, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be forever, but in the temporary, use sound. Ears love to hear. We'll try to relax the mind by listening to uh, a relaxing sound. Now, if you don't enjoy the sound that you're listening to, it's not going to relax you, but put on birds chirping, put on white noise, purple noise, uh, a sonata or anything that relaxes the brain uh, with sound is going to, you know, again, we want to bring down the, the anxiety level. So, um, you know, so things that, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's funny because, and I don't say this on the first session usually with my patients, but what we come to realize is that tinnitus actually becomes your friend or your teacher. I will say teacher. And that you sometimes patients actually are glad they have tinnitus. And I know that's unbelievable to many, but what happens is, is that again, you, sh you these people eventually shift tinnitus from bothersome to non-bothersome and the tools that they use to manage tinnitus and to shift it are tools that they can use for any kind of suffering in life. So, you know, in a way they, you know, tinnitus becomes their, their stress barometer. Okay, so if tinnitus is particularly bothersome on a particular day, yeah, it means you got to push back from the desk and maybe go for a long walk outside. Maybe it means you can't push so hard that day. Maybe you need to find a way to get a little bit more rest or a little bit more sleep or, or what have you. And so it becomes your maybe your lifetime barometer for when enough is enough. And, you know, so in some ways people, uh, you know, in some ways tinnitus is a stress disorder. And so you know, thank God people are coming into me with tinnitus and not uh, brain tumor, cancer, heart attacks, strokes. And those are diabetes. I mean, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Those are stress related body illnesses. Now, we have said before that tinnitus is a stress related body illness, but thank God it's benign. OK, so the person that's coming into me with bothersome tinnitus. Now, thank God they have you know, they have ways that they, they will be working on bothersome tinnitus and finding ways to relax themselves because those same ways that they relax themselves might actually prevent the stress-related, more severe, not benign body events like strokes and heart attacks and things like that. So, I, you know, it becomes your teacher, not your friend per se, but what we come to realize, again, when we can get that 30,000 mile view or foot view, um, it, foot view 
is that actually in the big scheme of things, the way that I've learned to manage tinnitus is a, is a really wonderful way for me to manage stress and anxiety in my life now and forever. And, 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 I love that. Uh, I think we all uh, are constantly looking for ways to become more in tune with ourselves, more in tune with our bodies and, and, and understanding ourselves a little bit better. And it's something that as we age becomes even more important, definitely. But I like that, that reframing of, of tinnitus in for people that may be struggling with this and seeing this as such a negative aspect of, of their lives that they have to deal with in a, a, a sentence uh, that they have to live with, but rather um, how can it be helpful in helping right. maintain our holistic health? Absolutely. Right? Um, Dr. Gans, we are just about out of time, but we spoke a little bit earlier about um, what not to do with online searches and how not to get into that rabbit hole. I wonder if you have any advice for our listeners of what to do. What are some good reputable sources for them to turn to if they want to learn more about tinnitus and its effects and treatment? Well, I'm not going to say don't go on the internet, even though I kind of think that would be helpful in some ways. Uh, but, you know, go on to the course, mindfultinnitusrelief.com. Uh, you know, it's helping people all over the world shift, do that shift tinnitus from bothersome to non-bothersome. And it's, you know, shown in the research to be so effective. Um, you know, there's, um, there are different, uh, the American Tinnitus Association is very reputable. Uh, you know, they, um, uh, it, it's, an, it's an organization that's working really, really hard to get accurate information out to the masses and to be a support and a, a source of accurate information to the world. Uh, so that's another good uh, place to go. Um, gosh, go to your, you know, go to your audiologist and, you know, go to your general practitioner um, and hopefully they know something about it. But, uh, you know, you just, like with all things, you, you just have to be careful out there. It's not always safe. You know, it's like, be careful out there. When you go on the internet, you will be, be, you will likely be bombarded with a lot of false information. So going directly to, um, you know, a source like this course or um, something like it can be, can be really helpful or, or just don't go at all, um, which is hard to do. But, you know, stay out of the chat room, stay out of, you know, support groups that are not mod are moderated accurately can really be a, a uh, people, people become professional tinnitus sufferers and you don't want to become that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's tricky and, uh, you know, hopefully things will get better, but, uh, there's a lot of junk out there. And so you don't take everything for granted. You gotta, you gotta find out what the real source is. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Gans, I want to thank you again for joining us yeah. for this um, yeah, continued social work podcast today. This has been such an enlightening hour for me on a topic that I didn't know very much about. And and so I, I want to thank you uh, for helping to enlighten us and enlighten our listeners as well with those, those numbers and those stats that you gave us at the beginning of the conversation. I think that all of us, either in our professional practice or in our personal lives, may know somebody who is experiencing tinnitus and mm -hmm. and and hopefully um i this conversation will be helpful for them but thank you for sharing your expertise and thank you again for joining us for this continued podcast oh and ben i i really do appreciate you having me on today thank you so much